um, uh, there's a few themes, and then it's over to you. But uh, what I suggest is, where has Al Qaeda come from geographically and politically? 20 minutes. Where is it now, and where is it going to? So if you can theme your own responses and questions in that order. We all want a briefing. That's why we're here, some of us journalists. Uh, you know, who are the personalities? What is the philosophy? Where is the geography? And please, if you're not getting that, it's fine to criticize the evening. You know, I've come a long way from Putney, and uh, <laughs> you know, I need you to come back to the point. Don't be afraid of that. It's a public meeting. Now, I've asked our fabulous panel to give two minutes to tell us where they're coming from. They can divide it how they like, a bit on them, and the one thing they want us to take away from the room. So if they want to take two minutes on themselves, they can. Um, Deepak, give me your name and fill your two minutes how you will. Right. Um, my name is Deepak Tripathi. I am a journalist, um, have never been anything else. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I left India and worked for the US federal government for three years as a journalist. It wasn't a journalist job at all. Um, I was part of the United States Information Agency. Not a very happy period, but <coughs> productive in one sense that I got really focused on American foreign policy. And that was towards the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, I came to work for the BBC in 77 and retired suddenly in 2000. But in the early 90s, I had spent 15 months in Afghanistan uh, setting up the BBC Bureau. Uh, and I'm happy to say that that Bureau continues to, to function today, despite the odds. Uh, at that time, the Soviets had just got out officially. Um, unofficially, they, they had not got out because the soldiers, you know, the advisors were still there. The embassy was full staff. Uh, and uh, the advisors were basically running the various ministries in the Najibullah government. But the Najibullah government was uh, crumbling. Um, I think my two minutes are about to be over, but in the last 20 years since setting up the BBC office, I've been interested in Afghanistan and West Asia in general and American foreign policy and how the Soviet Union collapsed and how its consequences came before us. Camille. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm a Lebanese uh, journalist. I work for Al Hayat newspaper. It's a leading pan Arab newspaper based here in London. I've been working for them uh, since 1991. I've, uh, I've covered Islamic groups, militant groups in the Middle East uh, since that time. I have uh, two books in Arabic. One is specialized on the Islamic militancy in Algeria. It's called the uh, Islamic Movement, the uh, Armed Islamic Movement in Algeria from the Feast the, uh, to the GIA, two, two groups in, uh, in Algeria. My second book is uh, Al Qaeda wa Akhawatuha, which is translated into Al Qaeda and its brothers in arms, which was uh, uh, translated and published with updatings by Asaki uh, publishers uh, recently in, in uh, September this year. Um, um, I still cover the, this main issue, and uh, you know I focus on Al Qaeda and its brothers in arms. Can you hear all right? Yeah. Um, deep. Uh, so I beg your pardon. And uh, 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 to you, Maha. Uh, my name is Maha Azam. I am an associate fellow at Chatham House, which is known also as the Royal Institute of International Affairs which deals with international affairs issues. I'm on the Middle East and North Africa program. I've written and commented on political Islam for many years. Um, I come from Egypt and uh, originally, and uh, I started my work on militant Islamic groups in Egypt during the 1970s. Um, and the jihad group uh, that was responsible for uh, Sadat's assassination. Um, and. Um, uh, at the time, um, I managed to interview some figures that later became known as some of the most radical uh, figures uh, involved in militant Islam. Uh, one of them, Sheikh Salah, uh, um, uh, uh, who was in, uh, in prison in, in the United States, and also uh, Ayman al-Zawahri. Um, I have uh, continued to look at uh, Islamic groups in the Middle East, uh, those particularly that seek uh, political reform and want to become part of the political process, but I also look closely at Al-Qaeda and uh, its ideology. Norman. 
<coughs> my name is Norman Penultman. Originally, I'm a Libyan. I'm based here in UK. I did serve with the Mujahideen during the Soviet period when they invaded Afghanistan. Uh, I used to be one of the leaders of the LIFG, Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. And this is what I can say about myself. Unfortunately, if you need to know a lot about myself, you need to work very hard to get to that. And a lot of people, they failed. <laughs> What a nice beginning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most important thing for me is regarding the issue to put it in context. You know, I think it's uh, terrorism or like armed group. I believe uh, the war's yet to come. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, off we go. Over to you in just a second. Uh, you, all of you didn't really give me where we are. Uh, wh where we are now. But I'll come back to that. I wanted to go back. Where from geographically? Where from politically? Uh, Deepak. What's the history in a nutshell? Where was the geography? Where was the politics? Don't, don't take all your time now. Get us going and we'll go down and then we'll hear from the audience. Well, let me say in a sentence that my view is I swim against the tide. And my view is that the scope of Al-Qaeda and its threat um, by and large is an invention of the West. Uh, what we mean by al-Qaeda is a number of local insurgencies rooted in local causes and local conditions. And of course, there is some cooperation between them. Um, depends on whose narrative you, you, you trust, you believe. Um, official narrative is that um, the Taliban came to power at the end of the Afghan war and collapse of the Afghan communism, uh, they invited al-Qaeda, al-Zawahiri, and um, Osama bin Laden. Uh, this is what we hear from Washington and from London and from other Western um, capitals. And that uh, they gave sanctuary to a large number of jihadis who trained and then launched the 9-11 attack. And since then, there is a threat to us um, of the same monstrosity that Soviet communism was. Um, I do not believe that uh, Al-Qaeda, what, what we mean by Al-Qaeda is a bunch of local insurgencies. They are rooted in, you know, in, 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 in the legacy of um, the neo-colonialist era. There are local problems, local discontent, and therefore local rebellions. The reasons are largely corrupt governments, um, utter poverty, um, collapse of constitutional government in any sense, whatever form of government each country has, and America's uh, propensity to prop up corrupt governments. So it started as a, a protest within national borders against similar sorts of, uh, c uh, of circumstances. Well, it started, well, I think that the origins of what we know as Al-Qaeda started with the Muslim Brotherhood um, in, in 1928 or so. Um, and the Brotherhood actually, and la uh, later on its successors, Islamic Jihad and mm, Al-Qaeda and, 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 and Taliban and others, it spread. Um, on the other hand, in the late 19th century, there was, and, and this is not very well known, an Indian uh, Islamic movement called Deoband, Deobandi movement. And they had rebelled after being suppressed by the East India Company in India. Uh, so these two influences gathered together. And what we know as Al-Qaeda is actually a neo-colonialist -colon reaction to uh, decolonization. So it goes back as far as, uh, as the late 19th century. Do any of the panel I, disagree? Uh, I tried to show yeah. in my book, Brothers in Arms, that you cannot understand Al-Qaeda, uh, the, the organization we see today, unless we understand how its brothers in arms tried to topple Arab regimes in the Middle East and failed. I, I looked into three main issues that, that took place in the Middle East in the 1990s, in Algeria, Libya, and uh, Egypt. OK, you skip forward to the 1990s. That's the most important. No, I mean, you know, Al-Qaeda cannot be understood until, until, until you understand why these jihadists failed, because they affected how Al-Qaeda progressed into the organization we see today. However, Al-Qaeda even progressed more 
after the uh, Americans went to Iraq in 2003, when Al-Qaeda became a franchise with branches uh, all over the, the Middle East. Right. We have Al-Qaeda Central in, in Waziristan or Afghanistan, Pakistan, and franchises all over the world. I think in general, I agree with what was being said, but I think the detail is, in my opinion, incorrect. I think Al-Qaeda is a reaction to military occupation in Muslim lands. And it was one, one manifestation of many Islamist responses that started in the 19th century. It is perhaps one of the most militant and most terrorist-like that we've ever seen. I don't think it's necessarily an outgrowth of a group like the Muslim Brotherhood. I think that is what I heard a lot of while I was living in the United States over the last four or five years, and I think that is absolutely incorrect that the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood was a social and political movement that emerged in the early part of the 20th century. The writings of its founder, of one of its <coughs> prominent ideologues, Sayyid Qutb, was used in a particular way to instigate uh, terrorism by some, but the organization itself cannot be connected to Al-Qaeda and what happened in Afghanistan much later. It is r true that the failure of Islamist groups and the belief that all Islamist groups were militant did made, created a situation where there was no ceiling on militancy. We saw militancy increase over decades, over the 20th century, to reach a high point in the 1990s, which manifested itself in Al-Qaeda. So two of you say the 1990s. That's what, if we want to examine it. To you, no man, when you were inspired to fight in the Mujahideen, that was the uh, late 80s. Would you like to put a date on the beginning of Al-Qaeda for us? <coughs> August 1988. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Yeah, that, that's the roots of Al Qaeda. You know, if we talk about as an entity, this is Al Qaeda. But if we talk about the overlap of ideologies or how people they influence each other, yeah, you can take it back to the 1924. You know, when the Caliphate officially being demolished, and then the Muslim Brotherhood they established their own and their own organization as a response. To that. This is the main crisis for all the Islamic movements. The jihadists, they stick with that, if you like, uh, whatever tab or whatever you're going to call it, but the rest they move on for, like the Muslim Brotherhood, they decide to dismantle their uh, armed group and then they carry on their work like as a social force or social whatever you're going to call them. So I, I don't accept the idea like they are one group or the roots of Al Qaeda we can trace back to the Muslim Brotherhood. For me, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You know, Al Qaeda, even to the jihadist group, which has been established uh, maybe 40 years ago, it's uh, I can't refer Al Qaeda to that group because Al Qaeda, its its roots, you need to look to uh, Afghanistan era. You know, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, that's when Al Qaeda start to be uh, like appear as a group, and very late. At, as I told you, it's 1988 because even a lot of Mujahideen, the vast majority, including Abdullah Azam, yeah. they don't accept the idea itself. And it, although all. we know you've, your life's changed, what was in your heart when you, when you signed up to the Mujahideen? Was there anything Al-Qaeda about you then? Or did that, was that uh, stolen <laughs> by Al-Qaeda, the Mujahideen feeling? Was it stolen by Al-Qaeda or do they have similar roots? You know, I, I think here, uh, you ask me very difficult questions. You know, it needs like forever to answer that. <laughs> but it's. Uh, yeah, I didn't sign with anybody, you know. My group is the LIFG, Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, which is, has to do with a Libyan issue, a Libyan local problem. This is the main, the main reason for it. When I went to Afghanistan, it's just to help the Mujahideen because I believe like it's uh, an opportunity for me to like uh, execute the way uh, some of my ideologies or st things I believe in. But it was the main issue. It's like to help the Mujahideen and uh, the situation in Libya at the time helped me a lot as like a Bush, uh, force, you know, to get out for the Islamists they used to live there in Libya. But, uh, yeah, I, I believe Al-Qaeda now and with the uh, uh, the Egyptian Jihad led by Dr. Ayman Zawahiri, they're not just uh, hijacked the idea of Jihad or as the duty of Jihad, they hijacked the whole Islam. Okay, so that, we're coming to the present in a moment. So we're hearing 1988, we're hearing it began in Afghanistan. Do any of you disagree with that before I ask another question? Coming to you in a moment. Uh, yes. I think it is important to know that something existed because before Al Qaeda in 1988. Al Qaeda didn't pop up suddenly. You know, it, it wasn't a new entity. The people, Al Zawahiri, Abdullah Azam, um, Osama bin Laden, they were there before 88. I think when I talk about the influence of, especially the Muslim Brotherhood, um, it has had several in incarnations um, up to Al Qaeda. 
Um, the thing is that the most important thing in all of these um, uh, networks and organizations, as, as Maha says quite rightly, is that they are very anti-West. Uh, and, 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 and the, the two things Muslim Brotherhood and, and their success has always said, that capitalism exploits people, uh, communism actually humiliates people. Both are bad as each other. Uh, and the, upper, the, the alliance in Afghanistan between America and Al-Qaeda or its predecessors was purely opportunistic. I'd like you to, to read a, a chapter in my book, which... Uh, which uh, don't say it again. <laughs> we won't. Don't say it again or we won't. Just keep going. No, I, I, I want to highlight the issue of uh, the clash between the Muslim brothers, Brotherhood and the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, because they are not one and the same group. There were clashes between them, and Dr. Ayman al-Zawahri wanted to try uh, Dr. Abdullah Hazam and even kind. kill him because of certain accusa accusations against him. Okay, now in the interest of moving us on, you're taking us into personalities, so let's do that, then we'll come to the audience. We asked where did it come from, you've given us your views, you've also said when. Let's talk about the people who started <coughs> Al-Qaeda, do continue. Yeah, Osama bin Laden, it was, I believe it was his idea to create this organization. However, a lot of people who joined in with him uh, were mainly from the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. They, they, uh, he, he, he had the money, he had the idea of creating an organization that overlaps, overlaps countries. He did not want a, a, a specific organization that concentrates on one country. He, his organization, uh, contrary to other jihadi organizations that were created at, the, at that time, that focused on certain countries like Libya or Egypt or Algeri Algeria, his organization, Al-Qaeda, focused on all the issues that concern the, the Muslims around the world. And what country was he living in when he started to join he, the dots? He, he joined the Afghan Jihad uh, at the early 1980s, but he created his or organization, as Noaman said, in August 1988. In Afghanistan. In Afghanistan. And to you, Maha, wh 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 which personalities other than him? I mean, the, 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 s the second in command, if you like, is Ayman al-Zawahri, who was the head of the Jihad group in Egypt, a group that eventually had to go elsewhere, but Ayman Zawahri's commitment was to uh, Afghanistan at a period where he went as a doctor, he was trained as a doctor, to fight with the Mujahideen and to, against the communists. So the, the, the jihad issue is very important. Afghanistan was the arena then, but the whole concept of jihad and the appeal to Muslims from different parts of the world is a very old one, and that somehow comes back to what you were saying. The notion of fighting the holy war for Islam, for, for the protection of Muslim lands and Muslim communities is a very old one. That's why you had young Muslim fighters going to perhaps to Shashenia, who were willing to, if they could, go to Palestine, who went to Afghanistan to fight communism. It's fighting the good fight. So in a sense, this may take us, this is a point that we might bring up later. Is it about Islam or is it about also much more than that in the minds of perhaps Muslims here in Britain? It is a course celeb of fighting the imperial power, wherever that imperial power may be. And this is an old historical issue. This is not something that's appeared in the late 20th century or is only with us in the 21st century. And Muslims today, whether they are in the West or in different parts of the Muslim world, feel committed to fighting this injustice. Now, the problem is that terrorism is the weapon of the weak, and some have resorted to taking up that weapon. What's the question? <laughs> well, if you don't have one, we'll turn to the audience. Uh, would anyone like to? Yes, here at the front, here comes a microphone. Um, again, we're just trying to canter through where did it come from geographically, politically, and personalities. So don't go too much in the present, then we'll move on. Very quickly, um, Al-Qaeda's ideology has been mentioned a couple of times, but could you all explain what you think it actually is? Yes, let's start with you. What is Al-Qaeda's, uh, per uh, uh, sorry, what's the word you use? Ideology. 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 Norman. That's a very interesting question, because this is the main problem between the Egyptian Jihad and Al-Qaeda, uh, especially Bin Laden during the 80s, you know. And I'm telling you here f that f as, as a witness, part of this conflict, because I know both of them. At the time, Bin Laden, he refused, because if he gave an advice from an Egyptian scholar, you know, at the time. So he said, I don't want any specific ideology. And he always against anyone to write a book or a, or a doctrine or whatever you're going to call it, or a constitution as the rest of the jihadi groups, and everybody should go through that book to be a real member of Al-Qaeda. 
led and spent all the 90s against that idea very, very strongly against that. The Egyptian jihad, they were in favor of that idea because they would like to impose their own jihadi constitution, which is known al uh, fi uh, al which is written by Dr. Fadl. He's now in Egypt, in prison. Uh, Bin Laden refused that. So this is one of the main issues. Everybody, didn't, including myself, we didn't take him seriously. We, we used to believe like Bin Laden is just joking. Someone, someone like he has got idea, he's get excited, interested with jihad, and then he has a lot of money. So he'd like to create something. Yeah, this is, this is Al-Qaeda, because if you ask yourself why you don't heard of it before, it used to have millions, a lot of infrastructures, a lot of people, especially from Saudi Arabia, but why the world never ever heard of Bin Laden or Al-Qaeda before? Because they weren't serious. But what happened to Bin Laden, 1990, that was really, I think, the U-turn for Osama Bin Laden when the US held uh, the Gulf states to get rid of uh, the Iraqi army when they occupied Kuwait. Bin Laden, at the time, he got frustrated. And he said, OK, this is my chance. I need really to do something. Because he believes the Ba'ath party ruling Iraq, they are non-Muslims, absolutely, including Saddam Hussein himself. So he said, I can mobilize the whole Mujahideen. And this is just idea in his mind. Nobody would listen to him. But he said, I, I, would, uh, I would like to mobilize the whole Mujahideen from Afghanistan, and we will do like the army work for the Saudis and the old Gulf states and get rid of Saddam. And uh, I think he wasn't that clever to do that. You know, because he doesn't understand exactly what's the meaning of jihadi business. And he went to deliver that message to the head of the Saudi intelligence service. He told them, I, I would do that, but just you need to stop the process of, get, of, of getting the US here. Yeah, I think the, U, the, the Saudi intelligence service they interpreted this message in a completely different way. They start to believe this is the real threat against Saudi Arabia. Someone, he has like a couple of hundreds of militant people from the Gulf states, and he's willing to deploy them in Saudi Arabia and to fight against Iraq. So the response from Saudi Arabia at the time, they confiscated his passport, and they said to him, you have to stay here for good. Forget about Afghanistan. Then he managed to get back to Afghanistan and that's Bin Laden, what you see now. Th that's the U-turn of his, of his, like, uh... Right, now the question from the floor, and the floor is the altar, is um, what's their philosophy? Yeah, this, this is the philosophy. You've just it's said it's about him. So yeah. is that the philosophy now? Because him, Bin understand him, you understand... It's about him. What's the philosophy? Here's comes the philosophy. He said, all the guys, it's including discussions between myself and him. He said, you guys, all the jihadists, you failed because you fight at the national level. None, none of the Muslims. I, I think you know he has an idea of creating an Islamic state according to his own interpretation of Islam. So again, it's him. The, f the question is, what's the philosophy, and you're telling I, I us his I, philosophy? I think you know it's his interpretation and the people around him. It's the jihadi ideology of interpreting Islam and wanting to create an Islamic state according to their interpretation of Islam. So I'm not saying he himself. I'm saying the people, he and the people around him, especially the Islamic jihad people. I think they left a great impact on, on his, uh, his, his ideology. And do, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Do go on. What is the philosophy, if you could put it in a paragraph? Uh, as I said, you know, they, they, they have this idea of creating an Islamic state, topple the Arab regimes, which they accuse of being apostate uh, regimes in the Middle East, and maybe liberate what they considered as Muslim lands. But these are only ideas, but their main, fo main focus is the Middle East and creating Islamic uh, uh, governments in, in, uh, across the Middle East. Can I say in one sentence, as I understand Al-Qaeda's philosophy, and that is to purify corrupt Arab lands by violent means. I think I, I'll build on that because I think that's, that's exactly right. I think that we can draw out some other strands and among those are the fact that the, it's, it was anti-West, but particularly anti-United States. And we need to put that in the historical context of Iran and the Iranian Revolution and the Great Satan. And that Al-Qaeda and the anger at the United States regionally also evolved from that. It evolved post-79. And it was, uh, it was in the Sunni world there that we again saw a new anti-Americanism developing and in response to American occupation and uh, involvement in the Gulf and elsewhere. I think there is another strand, which is the issue of the caliphate and some kind of unity over and uh, above the nation states and nationalism that brought nothing in terms of development for the region as a whole. I think the ugly face, the particularly ugly face of Al-Qaeda and its philosophy is its anger 
and its antagonism to Shia minorities, to Christians as we've seen recently, and to, to, the, the, to the very issues of um, uh, uh, ethnicity and, and other faiths in the region, and what the about sort of lack of tolerance. And what about women? And the issue of women, which again is not clear in a sense, we see it through the eyes of the Taliban and Afghanistan more than through Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. Because actually, Al Qaeda uses female suicide bombers. So, in a sense, there uh, you, have equality. you have you have no, you have you have involvement in, in a terrorist group or a revolutionary group, and it's something to take quite seriously. Well, the issue of the Taliban of keeping women away is, is a slightly different politics of women and feminism in the context of the politics of that region. We're moving on to the present, but your question's next, whether it's on the past or the present. But after this, we'll go straight to the now. I'm sli slightly disappointed that we haven't heard more about MAC and uh, you know, Hazam's involvement in the, uh, in the origins of that database and that, the, the role that played. Because my limited understanding was that the initial incantations, the ideas that weren't originally Ben Laden's, was for a rapid response force. Do you want to spell out what your understanding is and then we'll... we'll my understanding <coughs> from a limited amount of research did my dissertation five years ago was that there was a power struggle between al Sahar and Hazan and that essentially these ideologues, these two ideologues were battling for Ben Laden's soul, one being uh, essentially um, espousing terrorism as a means of control and the other espousing the creation through the database that the ISI and the CIA had helped create, MAC, which was the you know, foundations of this network, to create a rapid response force to deal with issues like Chechnya, like Kashmir, or you know, an, equ an equivalent, a Muslim equivalent of NATO. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. I think that's, that's, that's key, and I, I'm, I'm not privy to that information or to your thesis, which obviously would be very interesting to read. But I think clearly, uh, for all analysts, we know that there was a past struggle between the two, and Ayman and Zawahiri went in the direction of justifying civilian casualties of, of, uh, of going down a route that, in a sense, Al-Qaeda was eventually to follow. And that's why the assassination of Abdullah is, uh, Azam has such a big question mark over it, who actually uh, committed the assassination. But I think I would like to hear from Norman on that, on and uh, the, 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 the inside story, if you like, and of, of that struggle. We don't have all the time, but the, the gentleman's asking us, he's he wants you to link this other question in. Is he right? Is, is that an important, before we move on from this? No, I, I don't think, yeah, in general, you're right, but just the idea, you, what do you mean by Mac? Do you mean like the Mujahideen's peer servers? Maktab al khadamat The Mujahideen period, yeah? Yeah, no, no. I, I don't agree with you. No, 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 no. But, there, but, but there was a struggle between no, no, because he Abdullah was, he was, he was, uh, Just a second. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't know. Do you have any documents or like you can prove like it's being created by the CIA? Is there any evidence? Take the microphone. The money flows were the only things that we were able to actually ascertain. Very simply, there was just documentation that, you know, because in the Sussex University Library, so please go and check. Okay, there's mm -hmm. other e question. Sorry, I'm starting <laughs> to do go. Is there any evidence like there is uh, a cash flow from the CIA to any single Arab Mujahideen? Is there a one evidence? No, but I think there's a weight of evidence to suggest that they were originally involved. Yeah, in let me just explain. Uh, do Please I have like a yep, couple of minutes to explain it? Because it's a very yep, important we'll issue here. Look. Everybody knows America held it a lot, you know, and I believe if there's no America at the time, it's very hard to carry on the jihad against the Soviet Union. We have to accept that. But the point is, the U.S. held the Afghan Mujahideen through the ISI. It was very, very complicated and complex infrastructure. Don't believe that like the Americans, they're just hanging around there and throwing cash everywhere, like what happened now in 2001. No, it's not, it wasn't like that, because if any uh, Afghan Mujahideen leader, he accepted to act based on that role, trust me on that, he would be assassinated within one week. Okay? The Arab, yeah, they get benefit from that, but indirectly by the relation, like if you ask me myself as a Libyan, I worked a lot with Sheikh Abdurrahman Rasul Sayyaf and Jalal Din Haqqani as well. You know, but myself and other people, we don't have any connection whatsoever with any Americans or any other foreign countries. And I can, I can assure to you, themselves, they are smart enough 
to establish direct contact with these kind of people. Trust me on that. So if you talk about Maktab al-Khadamat, it's created by Abdullah Azam with the help from Osama bin Laden, and it's mainly millions and millions of Arab money. Most of it, it comes from like donation and zakat and Muslim charity. This is exactly the Maktab al-Khadamat. Al-Qaeda has nothing to do with that. Yeah, the struggle, you're right about the struggle, because Al-Zawahri and his people around him, when they've lost the power to take over Maktab al-Khadamat with like a lot of millions there, they, they, they create like, uh, I, I would like to, they create and design a problem, fake one between Bin Laden and al Zawa and, and Abdullah Azzam and Camille, he mentioned that in details in his book about how it's ended up even he's put before trial and okay. they would like to execute him. Right. The, uh, just a second, please. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's very important one. Uh, look, I'll tell you something. If you would like to talk about Al Qaeda, there's two approaches here. Either like as if you are investigating crime, so you need to go to details, and then there's the rest. Journalists, academics, whatever, you know, people enjoying their coffee and talking about Al-Qaeda. It's a different approach. <laughs> but you cannot understand Al-Qaeda without get to true details, and then you start to connect the dots, and you need to understand it after to connect it. So Bladen, yeah, he get the help from the jihadists, and the top leaders, of Al-Qaeda since it, it was established in, in 1988, yeah, most of them, they've been al al the jihadi member. Uh, they used to be from Al-Jihad group. And they've been deliberately, you know, asked by Dr. Fadl to help Bin Laden because they would like, at the end of the day, to take over the whole group. But Bin Laden, don't underestimate him. I'm telling you from, from my own experience, you know, he is very, very tough person and very stubborn. Right. If he believes in something, I think the whole world can't change his mind. This is exactly what happened to Al-Jihad group, including Al-Zawahri, when they failed okay. to like uh, infiltrate his, his mind and to make him as a puppet for them. Right. Now, we wanted your briefing. I'm interrupting you because I could listen to it all night, but I'm going to move it on. So are you satisfied that gets into your territory? You wanted it raised. No, to be quite frank, no, I'm not. No. I don't believe that Matt is, 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 can, can simply be sort of like... Dismissed. dismissed. Okay, well, I'm going to leave it there. You're, you're, you, you think it was left out. I'm moving to the present now. We've heard what the panel thinks. Sir, you're next. Do you have a comment about the present? Uh, well, I'm tending to slightly side with um, as some of the questions and answers, but I'd like okay. to put another perspective on it. Well, can you hold the microphone close then? And uh, 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 well, over to you. Yeah, so it was just the <coughs> first point mentioned about, you know, the ideology of Al-Qaeda. And should we be thinking about who's come up with the term and the Western perspective of what it actually means and the meaning of the word. And That's a present question, yes. Go on, go ahead with it. What well, do you think? Oh, well, although I'd heard the term Al-Qaeda a thousand times, does anyone in this room actually know what it actually means and yeah. who has brought the term? We're here for that very reason, so thank you for raising it. Deepak, answer him. <laughs> <laughs> I said uh, at the beginning that I'm going to swim against the tide. And I... I I beg your pardon, because you uh, guys uh, know a lot more about the inside uh, structure of <laughs> Al-Qaeda. But I'm going to sw swim against the tide. I said at the very beginning that in, it is my belief, and it is corroborated by others who know a lot more than I do, that Al-Qaeda, as it is portrayed as a single, all-encompassing phenomenon, um, posing a serious threat to the West is a is an invention of the West. I was listening to uh, Andrew Basovich the what other day. Why, the why did they call it Al Qaeda? The Frontline Club is called Frontline Club for some reason. Why is Al Qaeda oh, called Al Qaeda? Can I add just one question, please? No, I would like someone just to answer me myself. In a moment. How come in 20 years I, I used to call them Al Qaeda? Can one answer me about that we myself? Will, we will, but Deepak's got the mouth, and then you. <laughs> Say it again. The Frontline Club's called the Frontline Club for a reason. Why is Al Qaeda called Al Qaeda? I think some of what we're discussing lies in the answers to that, that question. It is very interesting that Al Qaeda, the term is used so frequently in the West and not so frequently in the East, where it is more active. Uh, you have Al Qaeda in the Maghreb, uh, where there are different groups, and I'm by no means an expert on a micro level, okay. but, but on a macro level, uh, then you have Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula, then you have the Taliban who are 
affiliated to Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Taliban affiliated to Al-Qaeda in Pakistan. But they are all different groups. In fact, in Pakistan, right now, there are only two groups involved in a major fight with the American forces. And they are either Hizb Islami of Hikmatyar or Haqqani's. So, so Al-Qaeda is in the eye of the beholder? No, it's, it's, it's sorry. One, two, one first, yeah. Okay. Uh, Al-Qaeda in, 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 in Arabic means Qaeda uh, al-Bayanat. Qaeda al-Bayanat is a, a database. It was a registry office for the people who joined the jihad in Afghanistan. And Osama bin Laden, after a certain time, uh, a period of time, people who were coming from the Gulf and uh, martyring themselves in Afghanistan, he wanted to register them with their details. This is how it started as Al-Qaeda, which is the database of uh, the people who were joining the jihad. Okay. Can I well, coming to you in a second. Yes, you answer yeah, his question because the <laughs> panel don't seem to be. Thank you very much. Uh, in 1983, Abu Abdullah Azam wrote an article, and this is a very important question regarding the terminology. In, in Ansar Mujahideen, a uh, um, magazine or journal saying Al Qaeda al which means the solid base. The idea which created later, I don't say there's an organizational link now between Abdullah Azzam and Donald, uh, but the terminology started from there. And this is the genealogy of the ideology. But can I come here about, can I? No. No? You, uh, keep, the, keep the microphone, and I'm going to come back <laughs> to you. Right. Keep, keep it. Right. No. We're going to move to the present. And we've tried to tackle what it means. Were you satisfied you heard three, three possible solutions? No. <laughs> All right, well, can, can right, I, you, go, you go, you go, I want to move no, on. One of you's got to tell no, the man. Cl clearly, it has a genealogy. It, ha it has a meaning in Arabic. It did have a starting point in the 80s. It meant a base. It, it collected these names. How it's evolved means that it's different. It's no longer a monolithic structure. We have cells all over the world. We have sleeper cells all over the world. We have groups that have, uh, uh, who, that are, um, call themselves Al-Qaeda something or rather, of the Arabian P Peninsula. We have Al-Qaeda in, in North Africa, um, Al-Qaeda of the Maghrib. Uh, uh, and so you have different bases that, that have links with Al-Qaeda. How, how close those links are, how real those links are, we are not always sure whether they are inspired by it, whether uh, the, the, they, they report back to a head is not always clear. Uh, and they it work independently. It means, Al-Qaeda means? Al-Qaeda means the base. The and base. Of Osama bin Laden and the second in command, Ayman al-Zawahri. Half the time we question also how well he is health-wise, whether he's still alive or not. And the cells right. that function elsewhere, whether they're sleeper cells in the United States or in Somalia or somewhere else in Africa, are inspired by Al-Qaeda of the 1980s and the Twin Towers of September 11. Right, that your, is the inspiration. Your, your turn in a second. Now we've turned to the present. Are you satisfied with that now? No. Why no. not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> You've got Why to move on, and you, the, everyone's trying no to give you an answer. Tell absolutely. me again. <laughs> no, don't. Tell me. No, it's your we're, meeting. We're, we're what what haven't you question. heard? Ask it, ask it again. Don't leave without your briefing. That's why you've come, and we're grateful for you. Ask it clearly. What have you not heard? What is missing? So we can well, fill in the gaps. If, if, any, if a person from Al-Qaeda was here today, yeah. would they, and then you said, you know, you, you are, you are, you are Al-Qaeda, Al you're the number two or number one man, would they actually agree with us? Yes. Yes. Would they actually say, yes. I'm the number one man here? Yes. No, forget about number one or three. Like, and he said, yeah, I'm a member of Al-Qaeda, yes. Right. And they are proud of that, very proud. Yes. Absolutely. A member of it. Yeah. Yes. You, if you go to, go to Yemen, to Pakistan. All right. So we're going to come back to that on another night. Now, to the present. You said terrorism is a weapon of the weak. Here we are in the present. Would you like to tell us, again, brief us, are they weak? or are they strong? We've heard you tell us about their origins. We, we know not everyone's heard what they wanted, but it's been very interesting for the most of us. If it's a weapon of the weak terror, and if this is their most frequently used weapon, do we learn that Al-Qaeda, whoever they are, are weak or strong, starting with you, Deepak, down the room and then to the room? I uh, partly agree with the notion that terrorism is the weapon of the weak, but terrorism can also be and is today uh, a weapon of the extremely strong. Look at Israel and Gaza. Look at the drone attacks totally unsanctioned by the United Nations or under international law uh, inside Pakistan. 
Look at the human cost. Look at the crimes, potential crimes against humanity. Um, people like Richard Falk, the uh, most distinguished, perhaps, um, expert of international law from Princeton, and right now the UN Special Rapporteur um, for the Palestinian territories clearly says that what is happening in parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan, what has happened in Gaza, and to some extent happening in the West Bank is, 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 is something where terrorism and warfare, the lines are completely blurred. Um, proportionality is a very important thing, aspect of war under international law. If propor proportionality is lost, then you are really potentially violating human rights laws. And that is what is happening. So weak or strong? Um, the, it, 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 well, terrorism can be a weapon of both strong and weak. The idea behind terrorism, the main motive is to force the other side to accept your point of view. I don't want to focus on state terrorism, although I believe yeah. states yeah. are responsible yeah. for a great Come deal to you of in a minute. Yeah. Virus, what that point of view is. Uh, you're, you're going to need a microphone if you're going to have that, and you can't have it oh, yet. Sorry. So All bear right. with me. You said yes. Okay. I don't want to focus on state terrorism, although states are responsible for some of the worst terrorism. I want to focus on Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda is, despite the fact that it, the counter terrorism strategies against it have succeeded to a large extent remains a very powerful force in terms of its ability, not in, in terms of its centralization, but its ability to function as cells that can terrorize. And but that is the strength of terrorism, that it is able to terrorize, that we cannot control it. And therefore, after many years into this game of war on terror, or whatever it is, we are still threatened today by these, this group that calls itself Al-Qaeda or its affiliates. So yes, it is stronger than we expected a few years back. D did you want an interview? Uh, yes, please. I agree with uh, the Keep gentleman the when he said that, uh, yes, they want us uh, Keep the in, front of our, in front of them to uh, accept their point of view. But why not be a bit more direct? What's that point of view? Is that Islam or something else? Right, the, the point of view of Al-Qaeda. Is it Islam or is it some kind of political movement, power for the boys? You know, I think, that, you know, is it violent for its own ends? Um, maybe we'll, we'll take your point. Would you answer it, Noman? Uh, is, it, is it just to promote Islam in, in a country which doesn't have enough Islam in the eyes of Al-Qaeda? And is it stronger or weaker than uh, a few years ago? No, the first of all, it's, it's about Islam, yeah, from their point of view, definitely, without a doubt. And it's all the main goal for Al-Qaeda to establish the Khilafi. This is the main goal. And it's been written. It's not just someone you can come up with your own idea. And this is what they teach people to inspire them in their seminars. This is the, the aim for them. But I believe, yeah, they are everybody using terrorism. And this is the way how they, they teach their people. You, are, you should convince yourself you are weak in comparison to your opponent. When, when you start to believe you are very strong, that's the end of you. So always Al-Qaeda believes they are very weak in comparison to the United States of America and its allies. But when they're using terrorism, this is the tactics of the guerrilla warfare. And it's been established like many 50 or 60 ye years ago. And every, th every, every like experience happened before starts from Mao Zedong, Gifara, whatever, it's there in the camps in Afghanistan. Everybody trained about that, especially the journalists, the way how they run the war. And they are very good about that. So you need to keep yourself weak. Don't appear. That you will make it very difficult for your enemy. You know, when you mobilize 100,000, uh, 150,000 well-trained soldiers, until now they're still chasing people. We even we can't see their dead bodies. You know, it's like 300 get killed in Helmand. And after two weeks, we find Taliban again controls Helmand. This is the strategy of the week. If they start to believe they are strong, you know what's going to happen? You will start, then you will see the dead bod bodies, you know, with thousands and thousands, because they will fight in a conventional war. So Al-Qaeda, yeah, they, they're weak in comparison to their enemy. But they are effective and lethal. Yes, I think in terms of terrorism, Al-Qaeda is very strong and even stronger than it was uh, several years ago. However, it is still a weak organization compared to what the jihadists tried to do in the 1990s. Uh, Al-Qaeda can today launch uh, attacks uh, at different countries uh, and kill hundreds of people, whereas 
uh, in the 1980s, you had but in the West, uh, they didn't control. Yeah, I mean, but 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 in in the Arab world, the jihadists nearly toppled governments and achieved their goal of uh, creating an Islamic state. Whereas today, Al Qaeda, although it is capable of launching attacks all over the world, it is not capable of toppling an Arab regime and establishing an Islamic state in its place. But, uh, but I question, were they ever really that close to toppling powers? I, I I perhaps through elections in peace in, in Algeria, peace was legitimately should have taken power. But when you say jihadists elsewhere, was the jihad group in Egypt capable of taking power? Yeah. As, unsavory, as unsavory as the regime is in Egypt, and I would have liked it to have been toppled, uh, the jihadists were in no position to do so. Okay, disagree uh, with that. You enter the room, yes. My name is Noor Khan. I'm not representing any organization. Um, the panel seems to be um, inextricably linking um, Osama bin Laden with Al Qaeda. Where has uh, Al um, bin Laden actually used the term Al Qaeda to um, to uh, call his own organization, not his base, but his organization, Al Qaeda? Um, and David Ray Griffin, one of America's most careful and judicious posi political analysts, as former CIA um, official William Christensen called him, in his book Osama bin Laden, Dead or Alive, represents a compelling case that he's been dead probably since mid-December 2001. Um, Oliver North has stated, I'm certain that Osama is dead. <laughs> and as one, uh, and, and w so, and so one and all the uh, other guys I stay in touch with. Right. President Musharraf, um, President uh, Ahmed Karzai also state he's dead. Okay, so he's driving a cab or he's dead, but you're saying it's about people. You, you, want, us, you want the panel to react, is he dead? And if, if would you accept that that's your question? If, if, he's, if he's dead, okay. then why are we still in Afghanistan? Okay, so is he dead, anyone? I don't, I don't believe he's dead. <laughs> I don't know. What evidence do you have, sorry? I don't think it matters now. If we find out he's dead, of course, the repercussions will be enormous on his followers. But I'm saying it doesn't matter because the fact is that the movement, in whatever form, weakened or not, has, has continued and, and to some extent flourished in certain parts of the world. Okay, right. Is there a question here? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm very concerned about the way the discussion's going. We started off by saying we have to be careful about the distinction between the jihadi groups and Al-Qaeda, but we seem to be confusing them all the time. Who is uh, mostly doing that? Who well, the every, every, everyone seems to be doing right. it. Uh, this well, this pick on one of them and then see <laughs> it's, it's very important in order to understand Al-Qaeda to actually understand that the jihadi groups are often nothing to do with Al-Qaeda. Mm. Even Al-Qaeda is probably way overblown from what, what we generally read, and as, as Deepak was saying. Um, but not only do we have to understand that jihadi groups are different, but even within countries like, say, Pakistan, there are many different types of jihadi groups who have very different aims from one another. And you cannot just lump them all together and treat them as being one Well, this was Deepak. Uniform. You must be siding with Deepak. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in that case, tell us what we should take from the room. What's your experience in this matter? What do you want us to know? And we'll check that with other people around the room. Well, basically, the jihadi groups, you cannot talk about them as one monolithic organization. <laughs> They're not. And what's your but experience in this? I, it, it's not important. I mean, it, you know, I've been studying this for a long time. All right. Um, but they are very, very different. In Pakistan, they are ex there are many social issues. I mean, they, there's an almost revolutionary element to it. What was happening in Swath was, to an extent, a, a bottom-up revolution taking place. All right. Weak or strong at the moment? What? The jihadi groups or Al-Qaeda? Ah, <laughs> with the jihadi groups first and then Al-Qaeda. Well, jihadi groups, depending on which ones, in Pakistan, they're getting stronger and stronger because of the way we're reacting to it. Right. Names, yeah. Can you give names, please? They want names. No. I, it's not important. No, the, the, the the names are, no it's not important. It's right. not important. To the back of the room, to the back of the room, and then you at, at the front. Um, so we heard it said, don't mix them up. What's your point? Uh, regarding terminology, I think in response to this gentleman's question, I think uh, Bin Laden did actually do a television interview where he said that it was the base and referring mm. to the Mujahideen camps in Afghanistan. Um, I think the CIA used it because they needed it, something to charge him with under a weaker warrant to freeze his bank accounts. But I think the terminology is less important than, as you say, how, whether they're strong or weak and what they're actually doing. I'd like to know if everyone thinks they're actually active and how active in, in each country. 
yeah, if, so there's, the... if there's supposedly lots of uh, Al Qaeda militants in the UK, what are they waiting for? I mean, it's not that difficult to kill a lot of people. Okay, so we're, we're now turning, you, you want to turn us to the UK. The, the topic that brought everyone tonight was inside Al Qaeda. Inside the UK, is there a significant Al Qaeda, let's call it, for the, because that's his question, a significant Al Qaeda grouping? To you first, Maha. I, I think that we, it doesn't, they don't need to be, uh, there don't need to be large numbers of Al Qaeda. You can have a, a handful, and I think the, the point that needs to be made at some stage is we're talking a, about very small numbers, but we're talking about numbers that exist in different parts of the world. But he's asking about the UK. About the UK. Uh, according to MI6 and so on, we may be talking in terms of hundreds. Hundreds in hundreds. the UK. All right. Hundreds, and, and that again is, is very broad. Is very broad. So if you say five, six hundred, five, six hundred who spouse support or who are ready to take action, are they sleeping? What do you mean cells? they're ready? What, what are they waiting for? They're sleeping? Opportunity, yes. They're, they're, they're you don't just, need there's, there's, there's serious security measures in this country and elsewhere. If you want to kill 200 people, you take a truck and drive it onto a train line and an Intercity no. 125 hits it and it gets well, derailed. Don't tell us how no. to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Your question was, how yes. many in the UK? Is, are you satisfied with the answer? That I, I don't know. I mean, but what I'm saying, the indicators are we're talking about s several hundred. Of those several hundred, it's, um, it's just noises, it's just talk. Some have perhaps... Can I have uh, the gentleman's opinions ha as well? ...have bomb-making uh, ability. We, we don't know. We don't know. And, okay. and that is the dilemma that's faced by security forces the world over, we're whether in democracies or in, in, in the countries that aren't democracies. We're talking today about people who are influenced by I an idea. We're not talking about members who have pledged allegiance mm. to Osama bin Laden and who have trained in Afghanistan. Maybe some of the, these people are operating here in, in, in the United Kingdom. You know, I don't know their numbers, but the problem is that some people have been influenced by a, an idea, and this, these people have no uh, direct link with the, with the Al Qaeda in, in Waziristan. Yeah, just because this uh, meeting, I think <coughs> it's uh, it's recorded, so that will <laughs> <laughs> control my contribution to this question. But I'm going to just say two two things here, and there is no follow up for that. <laughs> I believe there's at least 300 people. They went from the UK and they've been trained in Afghanistan. Number two, is their infrastructure starts from here, ended up in Afghanistan, which I mean like FATA, was your stand, the, the aid agencies there, facilitating the movement of the people, uh, including communication? The answer is yes. Honestly, I don't know how many Al Qaeda militants are here. <laughs> and, and I, honestly don't think that anybody who claims that there are s so many hundreds can be absolutely sure. Mm, absolutely. Um, we, can only MI6 uh, yeah. numbers and we can only go on the basis of what MI6 or even worse, ministers tell us. <laughs> but, but as we have seen under the Labour government, much less now, but under the Labour government, John Reid and David Blunkett would raise the specter of Al-Qaeda coming to kill us all every week. There were tanks, there were arrests, but most of those people were never charged. And that's why I think what we have is a crisis of confidence in government. And therefore, even when MI6 or MI5 uh, tell something that, uh, that may have some basis, people just don't believe it. Right, um, and we're here to know inside. So we, we may want to know how they're communicating. You may want to know, you know other questions. There's half an hour to go. You, you're next. Thanks very much. In the introduction, someone mentioned um, gross poverty as some sort of motivator for Al-Qaeda originally, or, or Isla Islamist groups in general. And we don't seem to have talked about that at all. We've talked about Al-Qaeda as, as an ideology, what they believe, and so on and so forth. Is there any genuine concern about the huge poverty, for example, in Pakistan and Afghanistan, as a motivator to trying to change the situation? By terrorists, me? I'm not a believer in the economic uh, background uh, explaining or poverty explaining recruits to Al-Qaeda because the examples we have of recruits to Al-Qaeda is a quite a broad cross-section of middle class elements, others who are poorer, others who are wealthier. The fact that you have countries like Yemen and Somalia and so on where conditions of poverty exist 
and where you have radicalization and so on, yes, that, that is true. It lends itself to radicalization and a loss of hope and so on. But, but, at, the si but at the same time, the recruits that are part of Al-Qaeda that have carried out the terrorist actions are not necessarily from a poor background. But so is it, uh, historically it was important, but we've moved on now. Al-Qaeda has its own model. I think there are no, two things happening at the same time. Yeah, you, 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 ha you have a shift towards radicalization in societies where there is poverty and lack of political uh, accountability and so on, but you also have recruits to Al-Qaeda cells that carry out acts of terrorism that, ha that, that come from uh, different social backgrounds. Okay. But it, well, no, because I mean, if you, if you take anti-poverty groups in this country, they're almost all middle class. They're concerned about poverty. They don't necessarily live in poverty, and, and so it wouldn't be surprising if... But, but that's precisely what I'm saying. I'm saying that those who, who hijack and those who put the bombs and so on, in a sense... Uh, are they concerned about poverty, is my question. Are they concerned about... No, I think they're concerned about military occupation. They're, they're right. more concerned about Iraq or Palestine or the United States and so on than they are about poverty. And you're nodding now. Uh, the no, so thank you very much. And one of the other questions that brought everyone here is where are they geographically strongest? Would anyone like to answer that before we move back to the room? Well, there's a lot of yes. talk of the Yemen, of course. <laughs> well, um, um, last June, there was an interview with the CIA director, Ian uh, uh, John, uh, Panetta. And Panetta was asked straight away, uh, how many um, Al-Qaeda members are there, do you think, in Afghanistan? And he said, probably uh, 50. Uh, <laughs> so it is certainly weak in Afghanistan. Um, Al-Qaeda affiliates may be slightly stronger in, in the tribal areas in Pakistan. But uh, as we know, that whenever there is pressure in one country, then they certainly the, 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 the for foreign fighters move on to others. And that's where, where we come to Yemen. Again, if you're not getting why you came, you must say, because there's only 25 minutes left. Hi, um, I'm the Times correspondent in Yemen. Just got back yesterday. Um, and I slightly disagree with you on that point. I think that a lot of the reason that Al-Qaeda is able to operate and live and survive in Yemen is because of the poverty. poverty. A lot of that is because of the weak government, um, because of corruption and everything else, and the lack of government around most of the country. But the reason that they are able to live amongst the tribes in Yemen um, and able to use it as a base and a home is because of the situation of poverty there, which is caused by the, the lack of government. And, and would but you like to give us a briefing yourself then? We've come to answer the question inside Al-Qaeda. What would you like us to leave the room knowing from your experience in Yemen? What must we know? Speak. Um, that you t said five or six hundred members in I, the yeah, UK. I, I, I know that's I'm a guess. Really, I'd say six, probably I'm in Yemen there probably yeah. aren't any more yeah, than that. Yeah. Al-Qaeda is not running around the streets of Sana'a. It's just yeah. not the case. Yeah. Um, it's an idea. Yes, it's an idea, and um, the, f the physical numbers are probably very small, but they are able to thrive and survive in Yemen because of the lack of government and because of the poverty and other <coughs> social situations. And do you Look, agree with why we heard the idea came about? Do you hear we heard the history earlier on? Do you get all that? You, you signing up, you're nodding to that? Yes, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, these, the, you know, you're far greater experts on it than I am, so in that sense, going back through the history, I wouldn't be able to sort of claim some great knowledge about it, but just from, from my experience from living in the country, that the reason they are able to and choose to live in, in Yemen is because it's, 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 a, it's an easy place for them to be able to do that. No, undoubtedly, I, I mean, the, the, the terrain, the tribal support, the, the antagonism towards Saudi Arabia, all that is, is fertile ground for Al-Qaeda in Yemen. But the point is that those that carry out the acts of terrorism that are terrorizing and making Al-Qaeda seem strong is happening for people from people who are not necessarily from those poverty-stricken areas and who have not experienced that poverty. So it's like and that is the key. So Marx what it's like need, Marxism. So what we need to understand is what motivates these yeah. people to carry out these acts in the name of Al-Qaeda. Is it similar to how we were taught Marxism? Yeah, it's similar to any revolutionary ideology yeah. that wants to challenge the existing order. I would say Al-Qaeda Central in Waziristan is the strongest among the Al-Qaeda franchises because the leadership of Al-Qaeda is operating there and the ideology is is, uh, is defi defined by the leaders of Al-Qaeda there. And, and the question inside, do they in each country, do they communicate? Do they swap uh, methods, ideas? Are they uh, 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 all around uh, the different places we've heard? Uh, Our question inside Al-Qaeda, in Al-Qaeda, are they communicating and swapping? Definitely they, they are cooperating. And there, is, there are messages uh, taken between Al-Qaeda Central Command and Al-Qaeda franchises all over the world. How? How in different, 
maybe the internet, maybe uh, people, messengers who are sent from messenger. one place to another, because it is the safest uh, way to communicate between uh, two branches of Al-Qaeda. Yeah, they are communicate. I, I think when, when we look to Al-Qaeda, it's, it's nice to ask these questions, where is Al-Qaeda strongest or where, whatever. I, I don't understand Al-Qaeda from that perspective. I believe Al-Qaeda, it's uh, the whole organizations, you know, and the branches all over the world, they contributing to the power of Al Qaeda as a brand or as the the if you like uh, the main drive force to recruit people for jihad. So the way how they communicate, yes, it's not just communication. Just I'll give you an example. As I told you, I don't I don't like to talk about philosophy. I have a lot of that. But how Al Qaeda in Algeria now the AQAM joined Al Qaeda, the main group. This is. Uh, I think it's a textbook example. How it, it took them two years to be accepted as part of Al Qaeda. Make no mistake about that. It's not just like an idea and there is no people. Okay, who's doing this? What's going on now? Who's running the strategy? Who's doing the fight? The statements. Who has the power and the authority to issue statements? How can you understand when Al Qaeda, AQAM, when they kidnapped five French people, the leader in Algeria, he said, if you would like to sort out the problem, you need to negotiate with Osama bin Laden. I will, can you understand this? Yeah, so give us another... Just, just a second. Please go on. No, don't just stop. Yeah. It's a power struggle in your homeland. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what happened, the QAAM, when they joined Al-Qaeda, because they used to have problem with the Libyans, my group, myself, I had a huge conflict with them, and my name, it's in their head list, <laughs> because I, I helped to destroy the GIA, and can you aware of the whole story? I destroyed them completely, and I'm very proud of that, mid-90s. So, Bin Laden, he was afraid, and Al-Zawahiri, the Libyans, they they're not going to join Al-Qaeda because of this conflict. Nobody trusts the Algerians because what they've done mid 80s When they start slaughtering people, killing everybody, they just gone mad. The Jia. So it took them two years, and it happened because they've sent people to Iraq, to Mus'ab Zarqawi, and then they start the negotiation, and Al-Zarqawi act as a facilitator between Al-Qaeda and Algeria and the headquarters there. It's a fact. So it's a sort of grooming abroad. No, I just, I would like people to understand. It's nice to talk about the, the level of like, you know, like, oh, the ideas, Marxism, I like this, what's the ideology? But you need to go deeper, you know, to understand exactly the organization itself. Don't forget the organization because you adopted to talk about concepts and ideas. You need to understand the organization, how it functions. Organization, it's very powerful, and this is the main power of Al-Qaeda, it's organization, not even its action. So it's the who's the boss? House. Who's the boss? Osama bin Laden, without a doubt. No, but in each country, you have to establish who's the boss in Algeria. I give you as a, okay. Everybody knows Drotkai, Abu Musab Drotkai. He's the leader in Algeria. But the guy in in, in Yemen now, Al Hashi, the leader of Al Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula, who appointed him? Is he just come? Just he likes the idea and said, okay, I'm the leader. Do you know his, his background? This guy, he served many years under Bin Laden directly. And he used to be the label as Bin Laden's secretary in Afghanistan and Pakistan. You should be aware of this. And Bin Laden, he sent him there. Then he get arrested. Then he ran away from the president, don't know how. And now he's the leader. This is Al-Qaeda. It's a group, a real group. I really want to take this further. We have an incredible privilege because you have the DNA of this thing in you, and that's very unusual. Not me. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned the caliphate. I don't understand all this small is beautiful thing. Uh, when the, it was September 11th happened, they said there were 35 uh, cells all over the Arab world, pan-Islamic movement, 35 different groups. These groups are coming together in the election in Algeria in the 90s. It came very, very close to uh, upsetting that situation. Saudi is a very perilous. Pakistani journalists all say we're right at the cusp now. All these things can change. Ahmadinejad even is part of this picture. If this caliphate, which bin Laden talks mm -hmm. about, what, what, is, is, uh, what kind of mutations do you think are possible across this pan-Islamic movement that would produce a caliphate? I mean, this is going somewhere. This is not going to stop. Now, you said it's going to get worse. That's what is why the larger I said, yeah. shape? You just answer my question. Yes, but what is the larger shape? How does that mutation happen? Do you think the nationalism This is the problem, because it's not going to happen. So the worst yet to come, because these guys, I've seen like thousands and thousands of these guys, like I've spent, some people, they said, Thank with you. all due respect, like they spent years studying, I spent years doing. Okay, over so to you. It's because they believe in the caliphate, and they believe they were never, ever going to rest until they established again, and they believe it's Islam itself. Just two days ago, I was in a conversation here in London with some people, old friends, they still believe in the same idea. We spent the whole night talking about, they believe caliphate itself, it's the Islam. 
If you don't believe in that, that means you are non-Muslim, which is, I think it's nonsense for me, because it's a political issue. Muslims, they can't live in an Islamic state, which is not caliphate, you know, but they believe it's part of the religion itself, the faith. What's the importance of this? They were never, ever going to rest and lay down their weapons until they get to there. And because it's not going to happen, if you see the future now, from now until maybe 60, 70 years, there's no environment which held the caliphate, the way Bilal understands, to be established, so they will get more, like, mad, right. if I say. Okay, pause there. Um, now we'll come to the other members of the panel, but you have the microphone now, and it's going over there. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify um, a little bit about what exactly Al-Qaeda was, because I think on this side uh, of the was. panel... Or is, um, <laughs> is we're not going heard to the word now. franchise <laughs> and organization, whereas on the other side, it's been more of an ideology. Okay, what do ideology. you really want to know in a sense? Well, essentially, what is it? And <laughs> if it is an organization or if it's an ideology, and if it's ideology, if my, if my friend here is politically minded, can she set up her own group and say I'm Al Qaeda? Okay, so we still or haven't answered this. You know, one of you's got to nail this. <laughs> it, 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 will you? I, I I think we have an enormous insight here, and what he said about the organization is crucial. As someone who studies this looks at it, he's absolutely right. But he's not also saying that there isn't the issue that there's I there isn't inspiration. Of course, that there are groups that will that, that there are groups that will affiliate themselves and really are not part of the organization that may not even be accepted. Yes. So, so in a sense, we're not saying things that are different. What we're saying, it's a building block. He's right. The organization's the core. It's what's allowed it to survive. It's what gives it strength. Can I add something very it's important we to it's this? It's no. weakened enormously. <laughs> yes. Right. Counter uh, counterinsurgency has worked to a large extent, but it continues to survive. <coughs> It continues to appeal. I need to say one thing that I don't agree with about this, though. Okay. I agree with don't. you on everything. <laughs> Except the caliphate, I think we have to be very careful. There are many people who propose the idea of the caliphate that are con completely against violence, who believe... In no, no, I'm talking about Al-Qaeda. Yes, but I'm saying that it's important for the audience also to realize... Not to link that the, the two terms. ...that the concept of a caliphate, of Muslim unity, of an idea of a Muslim ummah, and so on, is one that has existed for a very long time and is extremely appealing. And may be one that is resuscitated over the next decade or so in the Muslim world as a, in the context of an idea of regional integration and cooperation. Right. And that is an important dimension that is very, very different to Al-Qaeda. Okay. Uh, yeah, Camille and Deepak, you're coming in more in a moment. Let's go around the room now. All right. Uh, uh, this question does relate to the caliphate sort of thing. Um, in the 80s with the Mujahideen, when they were on our side, we were told that they were new George Washington's doughty freedom fighters. Then after 9-11, we were told that they were all a bunch of religious lunatics who were blowing themselves up for 72 virgins or raisins or whatever. Mm. What, what I'm interested in is what is the level of, of operational rationality, if you like, of both the leadership elite of al-Qaeda and of the foot soldiers? Are people actually going into to battle either as suicide bombers or, or, or warriors, believing in these sort of literalist tales of the afterlife and that sort of thing, or is this a more political struggle with a more greater degree of rationality with a degree of myth attached to okay. give it sort of meaning? How's Camille, that you first, then you, Deepak. You know, I don't believe people who blow themselves up uh, in what they think as uh, a martyrdom operation think of this idea as a lunatic uh, thing. They, they wholly, uh, wholeheartedly believe that if they do something, they are going to heaven. Is there a political uh, uh, side to, to this? Of course there is. Uh, Al-Qaeda has uh, a political uh, goals it wants to achieve. Its main goal is, as I said earlier, establishing Islamic State or Islamic uh, Caliphate. Uh, is this uh, reasonable to, to believe would happen? I, I don't see it happening maybe in years to come, but there is an idea of uh, establishing an Islamic State instead of the corrupt uh, un-Islamic uh, governments in, in the Middle East. Yeah. I think it is very important not to fall into this trap that uh, terrorists or Al-Qaeda mil militants in particular are a bunch of lunatics. They are totally rational people, cold rationality. And when a suicide bomber blows himself or herself up, they have thought for weeks, months, we call it indoctrination. There may be some influence of others, but as a group, they have decided that somebody, a suicide bomber that blows themselves up, will do the, 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 the returns will be higher 
later on ultimately than if they lived. Now, it may be a perverse rationality, but it is totally rational from their point of view. Okay, over to you. Yes, sir. Salam alaikum. Um, my question is fairly specific, and I apologize. I'm asking about the geographic strength of al-Qaeda in Lebanon. Um, if Hezbollah does move to take power in Lebanon after the uh, indictments are issued from the special tribunal, uh, do you feel that al-Qaeda has the motivation and the strength in Lebanon to be able to execute a wide-scale attack? I doubt it very much. I believe there are cells for al-Qaeda in Lebanon. But if you remember, in, after the uh, uh, spring and summer, uh, fightings between the Islamist uh, Al Qaeda linked militants and the, and the Lebanese army, uh, Al Qaeda has been weakened in Lebanon. Maybe it still has few cells operating in the country, maybe in the north or the Bekaa Valley, but uh, these cells are incapable of doing something major to upset the current situation in Lebanon, even if Hezbollah tries to take over the uh, government in Lebanon, which I myself doubt very much will do. Okay, now we've got about 20 minutes left, and if you still haven't heard what you came for, your time's coming. Yes? A uh, quick question. How is Al-Qaeda going to be defeated? You've mentioned counterinsurgency. What about um, um, uh, the, the possibility of a recantation by some uh, influential figure like happened with the Gamal of Islam is that, is that a, at all possible? Okay, so it, it doesn't have to be a brief question. You can keep the microphone as well, so we, we don't want you to leave without knowing that. How is it going to be defeated? Do you want to start, Deepak, and go down the panel? How can Al-Qaeda be defeated? Uh, first of all, I'll say what's in a name. Al-Qaeda could, in the next 10, 20 years, could have hundreds, maybe thousands of names. Um, there will be other uh, groups, networks, if not Al-Qaeda. A, a, a particular generation of a militant movement after a while exhausts itself. And then what we have is a reincarnation, which is often even more radicalized. And that's why we have the PLO and Hamas. And now even Hamas is, is, is considered to be a pacifist organization by certain uh, members of the Palestinian communities. God knows where we are heading. Um, but as long as there are causes, Palestine, what has happened in Iraq has dis created disenchantment to a, a great majority of Arabs. What is happening in Egypt, the, 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 the stolen election, if you like, or seats from the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in recent elections, as long as there sorry, are sorry, sorry to interrupt, we're not talking about local issues here. We're talking about a global jihad. That, that has declared war on Jews and Crusaders. That's what we're dealing with. Well, so how, do you, how do you deal with that? No, I, I think your, 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 your question, if I may so say so, with respect, is mistaken. Global I'm jihad I'm against what, the Jews. What, the, what, what was declared in the 1990s? Well, it, it, it by is uh, because uh, the, the, the thing that, that gives credence to this claim is Israel and what is happening to the Palestinians. B without that, you know, the global jihad against the Jews, n not many people will take notice of it. Uh, it, and, 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 and the same thing in Iraq, you know, uh, the same thing in Pakistan. People, when they are killed, when their lives are affected, then there is a cause, and Al-Qaeda will take up those causes. And you're, you're, the question was, what's, what's going to defeat it? And you're saying, well, if in the absence of peace in this conflict, a great uh, uh, other things are going to have to happen. But you answer his I'll, question. I'll tell you what's going to defeat it, and what is defeating it in the sense that it hasn't become as strong as, as, as it would like to have become, and that is Muslim rejection of it. It's something that we never give enough credit to Muslims for, and that is that the vast, vast majority of Muslims, 99.9%, .9 have rejected the strategy of Al-Qaeda. They may share some of the political grievances, but they have said no to its tactics. Al-Qaeda would have had much more of a groundswell of support in major parts of the Middle East and beyond. So you're really it saying would, it, it, is it, and, it is being Muslim, defeated? It is, and it has been over the last decade or so, because Muslim communities have rejected the whole issue of the resort to violence in the name of their religion. Now, we haven't come to this because we're talking about Al-Qaeda, but it's a very important thing to address if we're going to get a rounded picture at the end of this meeting. Okay. Because we're talking about Al-Qaeda and we're talking about Islam, and we're doing exactly what President Bush 
and his allies were doing at a certain time, which is connecting terrorism and Islam, despite all the nice things that President Bush and Blair said about Islam and Muslims. Yeah. And we've got to be careful not to leave this room with this connection. Okay. And to remember that Muslims have, over the last several years, through their ulama, through their academics, through their intellectuals, through their jihadists and others, and this is why the point that this gentleman was making is very important, there are an array of militant groups, revolutionary groups, but they may not want to pursue or condone the policies of Al-Qaeda. Al yes, and forgive me for stepping on your toes, but we will let you make that point at the end. You have points you didn't raise. We did come to answer the question inside Al-Qaeda, so the link has been made, but you're going to put it right at the end if you feel it's skewed. But uh, are you getting an answer to what's going to defeat it? Do you want to hear from the other panelists, or shall I move Can on? Can I just add something to this? Please add, but be brief. Yeah, very brief. I think there's three major issues. It's, as you mentioned, it's a global issue. You can't tackle it from a lo local perspective. But at the end of the day, I believe it's intelligence war. This is the key issue. It's not a conventional war. It's, it's, it's not the war you need to send like hundreds of thousands of soldiers to fight this war. Because here, you're giving them the war which they're looking for. You're nodding. You're just a second, just a second, please. Oh. This is the main idea. But you have three main issues. And will be very well. Just I mentioned the concept itself. Time. If you understand what's the meaning of time, this is what Al-Qaeda gain. They don't gain land. And this is what they use to teach people. I have to say that. Now, I expose myself. It's time. Only the Mujahideen or the freedom fighters, the guerrillas, they spent years and years fighting for time. This is the priceless thing you gain from any war you're involved in. If you understand that, you can reverse the cycle. The second issue is propaganda. I'm not going to say media. You need to defeat them at that level, propaganda. Most important thing here is you need to deny them access to the audience. So would you hear from moderate Muslims in the UK? Would that be, to, uh, to link this together, there are many people who are not interested in this, in defeating the idea, should we be promoting the many Muslim people who quite like Britain, even though they think it's making lots of mistakes? Is that a way to defeat Al-Qaeda in the UK? Yeah, yeah of course, it's, it's part of it. The third issue is, in the Middle East, has more freedom, mm -hmm. democracy, if you like. It's, it's a crucial. More freedom, more democracy to the people, open up the societies. It's very close, very narrow area. You can't breathe there in many countries. So you need to open up the, this is the three issues. Time, propaganda, democracy. I would say be fair. Show fair policies towards Middle Eastern or Islamic causes. Uh, if, if you take sides and uh, you turn a blind eye to what happened in Gaza in 2007 when the Israelis kept bombing uh, the Palestinians uh, there, you know, you, you need to show fairness. When you show, show fairness, you convince the Muslims in, in, the, in the Muslim world that you are fair and that Al-Qaeda is wrong into, in accusing you of being against the Islamic faith. Are you learning something? One issue important, please, here. Can the largest demonstration, waiting. just a second, the largest demonstration against the war in Iraq in the world happened here in London. And you cannot do that in any Arab country. Okay, to you, madam. I mean, you probably want to be called Miss, but I'm going to warn you, madam. Um, Jocelyn Cesari, a French scholar, says that uh, we cannot uh, understand Al-Qaeda uh, through the lens of religion. And uh, th that's one of the biggest mistakes of the West, um, to look at the Quran and to, and to Islam, uh, to search for answers and for explanations. Um, so we, used to, we, we need to use the political lens. I was wondering if the panel could uh, talk a little bit abo about um, this interplay b between religion and politics in Al-Qaeda. Maha, it sounds like you would like to have a little go. Deepak, yeah. then you, then to this audience member here. I know Cesare's work very well, and she's, she's a very respected scholar. Uh, and it's in order to understand the broad parameters, yes, politics is a very important lens, but I believe that on the contrary, the, this whole issue, because it's raised in, poli in, in, in Islamic terms and religious terms, also needs to be combated on the same ground. And this is, goes back to that question about how do you defeat it. And this is exactly part of the methodology that's being used by many in Saudi Arabia and Yemen, and has been used in Egypt and elsewhere, is to say, look, Th what you're doing and the, the appeal of Al-Qaeda and the call for arms and terrorism and so on is un-Islamic. And here are the principles and the verses in the Quran that tell you that you can't do this. 
Therefore, no, you've got to use religion in order to combat terrorism, especially when it's terrorism in the name of a particular religion. There was a, 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 a bomb in London Derry two months ago, and it, it, instead of blowing up the police, it blew up uh, an Arabic immigrant who ran a kebab shop. Mm -hmm. And I went there and I interviewed him, and he said that Islam taught him you don't lie where you fall, and he was going to stay in London Derry. It was very moving, but he did use uh, Islam to explain why he wanted to stay in London Derry, despite the fact that, uh, that uh, Christian people had tried to blow him up. So uh, it was an example of Islam I'd never heard used in the UK before. Do you want to add something to our friend, because we'll move around the room, if you broadly agree? I, I broadly agree that uh, Islam, first of all with Maha, that Islam is a religion of peace, and let, uh, and, and what people like Osama bin Laden have done is used Islam in a very selective way. The second thing is, when people are in difficulty, they always need a sucker whether it's Hindus, Christians, uh, Muslims. Relig religion in times of crisis, as they see it, is always used to provide comfort, to give determination to fight on their own battles. So although the, in the root of the problems is th they are political problems, but don't be surprised if somebody uses religion as, as a means of making a, uh, the struggle possible. Our panel is saying no to you. It's, it's, politi it's, not, it's politics and religion. Yeah, I, uh, I would just like to get a little bit more clarification on what I find to be an utterly, um, utterly and really, really utterly astonishing assertion made by Maha about 99.9% .9 Muslims rejecting Al-Qaeda philosophy. Uh, I would like tactics. to know... Tactics. Uh, tactics. 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 Yes, tactics too. Yeah. What has led you to believe this? And what do you think, just uh, before we know? I have been a journalist uh, uh, for the last uh, 27 years, of which 25 have been spent uh, in Pakistan, covering the conflict there. And I think Al-Qaeda tactics are now far more widespread in Pakistan than they were 10 years ago. And supported and, by? And uh, supported by people like us. Not, not the tribals in the tribal area, not from the rural hinterland, uh, the uneducated people there. Today, when the assassin of the Punjab governor was taken to the court, he was greeted there by a group of 500 lawyers who garlanded him, who showered him with rose petals, and 300 of them signed a petition requesting court to allow them to represent him. And the opinion that you see, the reaction that you see in Pakistan uh, from, uh, uh, to, to uh, the governor's uh, assassination is coming from literal, Educated people, many of whom, which we describe as the Pakistan's intelligence. So what are you saying? Um, are you saying Muslims? So what has what you led saying? you to believe you, that? No, I will tell no, you what. Yeah. Then. But are you saying that the majority of Muslims support the terrorism of Al Qaeda? Because in Pakistan, they were. Uh, I will never issue, say that, Maha. Issue, issue, but I will never say with but, uh, that yes. much confidence no, and but, conviction no, that 99.9% of right, .9 the Muslims. If you look at a country like Saudi putting Arabia, putting any kind of a figure in it, you, yeah. there has to be a reason for that. We haven't done a census, but what we know is Al Qaeda post September the 11th could have won ground in much of the Arab Middle East. And we know that opinion in Jordan and in Egypt and in Saudi Arabia, yes, because of terrorist activity against their own nationals, turned against Al Qaeda. And whereby the recruits and the numbers became minimum. And as we've heard from people in this panel, from the CIA, from MI6, that we're talking about numbers that are in the hundreds. From the journalists in Yemen that we're talking maybe about very small numbers again. That is what leads me to believe that in each category and through this, the security services, the numbers that we are concerned with are 300, yes, 250, but I, but 500, could we be, could, 600. Yeah. Could, that could, is could we be trying 90, to connect some, yeah. could we be so trying to connect two things that, that may be disconnected and, and here? Pakistan, that there, a is failure. A growing, right. there is a growing radicalization in Pakistan and a, a very frightening one. But the whole issues of blasphemy, anti-copt uh, 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 protests in Egypt, the action of Al-Qaeda is to do with that very organization which is a made up of a minority 
of Muslims. Okay. And that is what we're addressing today. Please, please gather your closing thoughts. You, uh, from the floor, have asked us to consider what's happening in Pakistan today as a very vivid example of support <coughs> for extremist methods. You've made yeah, tactics, you've tactics as well as that you clearly said it, and we thank you for making that point because it's really a public meeting. The gentleman behind you, panel, prepare your closing comments. Would you say that the uh, no, main no, no, challenge... No, 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 have you got a microphone? Yes. Oh, do go on. Yes. <laughs> Would you say that the main security challenge for the next few decades, if not the main challenge, is the possibility that Al-Qaeda or whatever it represents might get their hands on some kind of a nuclear weapons technology? Are they actively pursuing it? Is there a project within Al-Qaeda somewhere trying to somehow mm -hmm. forge I think links you know, with... I think if, if Al-Qaeda had the chance uh, of uh, getting uh, any kind of weapons of mass destruction, they wouldn't hesitate uh, in using these these weapons against civilian targets or whatever, but if they if they had the chance of getting their hands on on any of these weapons, they would not hesitate in, in using them. And they've tried before many times, you know, in Chechnya and other countries, ex -Soviet, ex Soviet Union countries, they've tried, you know, many times to get their hands on this kind of weapons. Is yeah. it an no, ongoing no, project no, as Bin Laden has no delegated people to? Weapons in but sorry, Chechnya, sorry, but bear with me. Just let this gentleman <laughs> finish. Yeah, yeah. To make this no, no, clear. No, no, we, said, we will come to you. No, no. <laughs> no, we will come to you. No, let I'm this gentleman no, no. let me let him finish. Just a second, just a second. I said, who's yeah. finishing? They, they've just tried, you know. All right. Have you got I There's no... If you don't have the microphone, please, you, you speak first. You can have it. Are they still trying? Has Are there a group of individuals assigned by Bin Laden to go after this? Okay, they're still trying. Al-Khattab, just I would not... You know, Khattab, the leader, the Arab leader in Chechnya, himself, once he was involved for that, to search for that kind, Khattab in Chechnya, which I know him personally, yeah. you know, okay. he was involved for this, but he failed. All right, now, you, you, you said you didn't want a microphone, you just, but you can't have yeah, one. Yeah, I can't, okay. right, because you take the microphone every time I'm there. <laughs> okay, we'll give it to you. No, you can have it. Oh, without but the don't go on, I won't... But, uh, you can Khattab... Here you are, involved, here it comes. Uh, there's Thank you very much. <laughs> no, man, you need to show evidence about that Khattab was involved because in Chechnya and they are reaching the Kazakhstan because they were in Tajikistan at that time. And I know Khattab and his colleagues personally. I'm from Zarka. I know the details, not as much as you know, but I know the details. But nobody can argue that there was a weapons of mass destruction in Chechnya where the quarter of population was killed with a volatility war. So I think it's a, not an argument to say that in Chechnya there was a mass of weapons of mass destruction. The other day I wrote an article about the legal of our Sharia, legalization of Al-Qaeda, Nasr al-Fahad, the Saudi cleric who've done that. It's just published a couple of days ago. There are an ideology. They aim to do it, but I don't think we can choose a certain areas that as, there was. As, uh, as, as seeking the weapons, all right? Oh. And to you, final word over here. Then the uh, panel members, the thing that wasn't said that you wished was said. And... Um, Heaven knows where we're going now. <laughs> I'm hiding. Uh, yeah, you, you know me, don't you? Yes. Uh, Frank Jackson World Disarmament Campaign. Just to, how's this yeah. going as a public um, meeting? Is it all right? It's fascinating. All right. it's, it, I would like you to go on for uh, several more hours. <laughs> there's so much I to... I told you he to knew to. about the history of public meetings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, quite. Um, but Marx was mentioned, and of course Marx said the philosophers try to understand the world. The point is to change it. As an activist, that... Um, is my particular concern. What can I do? Uh, we, we, I'm sure we all agree that killing in people, uh, whether they are so-called innocent civilians or even Taliban or Al-Qaeda, is, is fundamentally wrong. Although I'm a humanist, I still believe that the Christian uh, com Sixth Commandment is a very important basis of a civilized uh, society. So the question is, what can I what can the, all the people here, uh, what can uh, our uh, community generally and our government actually do to change the situation where uh, people want to kill others uh, for whatever reason, whether religious, political, or, or whatever? Do I have a minute, a minute, 15 seconds? You're going to have... Please do, but answer that question first, and then you'll have a minute. Yeah. It's, it's a luxury. Yeah. Okay, oh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. I agree a great deal with you. I think that the idea driven by the purely the counterinsurgency argument has had its day. We have seen in the last 10 years, we have seen in the last 50 years, that to consider people who don't agree with you are, are, and are prepared to take up arms, 
we'll go and kill them all. <coughs> In fact, militants, militant movements <coughs> often have, and this is not appreciated, often have strength in numbers. They may not have strength in weapons. I agree with you. Uh, uh, a lot of people may not currently advocate violence. Okay, you're, you're straying onto your closing remarks. A friend wants to know what can he do? What can he do? What he can, can he do as an individual? I think pressure his own government to pursue f f fairer policies towards certain parts of the world, whether, whether it's to do with uh, greater democracy in countries of the uh, Muslim-majority countries, whether uh, it's to do with issues such as when we, we had to face the Iraq war, whether it's issues to do with pa Palestinian rights, and so on and so forth. So these causes, ca these, these, right. ca yeah, <laughs> these causes uh, fuel resentment and anger uh, uh, among uh, generations. And yeah. no man uh, published an open letter to Osama bin Laden, having fought in the Mujahideen in 2010, urging him to renounce violence. That's what he did as an individual. What can he do as an individual? Yeah, I, I think it's, there's a little you can do as an individual, unfortunately, you know, because mm. the way how you understand it, you look like for a very peaceful world, you know. So, but I, I think war, it's part of our civilization as a human being. As far as I'm concerned so far, there's at least 5,000 wars being documented since our existence on Earth. So it gives you, the, I think, clear idea about war, it will stay there. What we can do is, as individuals, we need to act in you know, uh, together as groups or pressurizing governments or whatever to regulate war. This is the point. But if you think you're going to wipe out the idea of war from the world, good luck. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I don't think you, know, you, can, you, can, you can reach that idea of wiping out uh, a war from, 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 the, from Earth. Even Christianity, which is considered as a, a very peaceful uh, religion, uh, found itself at a certain po time in history uh, justifying the uh, uh, the what? Sorry, just war. Just war. Yes. You know, they even found uh, a Many justification for the the concept of just war. So we come to your closing remarks, and uh, if anyone in the room is burning to say something, we shall, we'll take it. Otherwise, please wrap up for us. You know, did you say what you wanted to say? What was the most memorable thing you heard? And then we'll thank you and, and get out. <laughs> <laughs> I was encouraged to hear from some people who said that Al-Qaeda should be taken far more seriously than we do, because we can't finish off Al-Qaeda in a month, in a year, probably in 10 years. Ten years. Al-Qaeda or its successors. Uh, Al-Qaeda is defeated. That idea, I think, needs to be treated with a little caution. My concern is this, that what we have seen in the last 10 years or so is a mindset among us that is dominated by three or four characteristics. First of all, exaggerate the threat. Overstate the dangers. Uh, this is mainly coming from governments. And then be convinced that the solution to perceived national security threats lies only in military solutions. And therefore, let's go the whole hog and kill people. And an unwillingness, as they say, to imagine the unintended consequences of war. And unless uh, we come out of this mindset, and I'll say one last sentence, there cannot be peace without justice. So unless there is a genuine start towards justice, we cannot hope to have peace in our lifetimes. What uh, did you hear from the room that you most uh, would like to take away and what would you like us to rem remember you uh, re telling us? I think that there is, uh, I would like to say that there is no ceiling to radicalization. There was a time when we thought that some of the militant Islamic groups were as militant as it got and then we had Al-Qaeda. I think what the gentleman said that the majority of Muslims or an increasing number, not the majority, but an increasing number of Muslims find militancy and the philosophy of al-Qaeda appealing, I accept. But I am, what I am saying, which is very important, is that the vast majority reject it, and that there can be new recruits to al-Qaeda unless certain changes happen in the world order. And that this issue is one that is 
that relates to all of us, but it is also an internal battle within the world of is Islam itself or among Muslims about the acceptance or rejection of violence. And for now, the vast majority of Muslims reject violence. However, if there is a continuing feeling of injustice, of military occupation, of undemocratic regimes, the, 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 the numbers the, of recruits that will be attracted to Al-Qaeda may swell. So you were on a panel and you accepted something from the floor which you'd earlier argued about. It's why it's been very no, interesting to I, listen to you. I've, you argued, I've argued about the point that I feel un very uncomfortable that someone is rejecting, given the numbers that we know, yes. that the vast majority of Muslims reject violence. Right. I'm saying that is not a stable situation. That, that can change. Appeal of terrorist tactics has happened before. We know this in Ireland. We know this in other cases. We know that the United States, a great democracy, had many in it that support, supported Irish terrorism. But you, you, it was interesting to hear that you, you, you disagreed with the gentleman. But I acknowledge it. I yeah, acknowledge no. it's a very important point. We've enjoyed listening to you as a result. Two more to go. What did you, did you want to tell us? What did you hear from the discussion? What I heard from the discussion, I think it's more related to discussion between Maha and the, our friend, the journalist from Pakistan. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Uh, I think uh, we should accept we have a problem within ourselves as a Muslims. We should accept that. And from my point of view, it start to be a cultural problem. <coughs> I know a lot of people, they can't say that, but it's a cultural problem. So what that's <coughs> supposed to mean, it means the idea of Al-Qaeda, which is like acting based on uh, nonsense violence, it doesn't need any organization anymore, which is a crisis within Muslims. Al-Qaeda, don't believe Al-Qaeda, they are non-Muslims. They are isolated, like as if they appear from nowhere. Al-Qaeda, they are Muslims, Sunni. They are us, part of us. And then we need to face it like this. What happened? So. It's, I believe it's a cultural problem because of the, the world we live in now, the environment. It doesn't need any more like sort of very strong organization. And I'm, I'm very careful. I don't want to compare them with the Nazis, you know, and Hitler. But before, if you have these kind of mad ideas, you need very strong organization to keep it alive and to implement it like a state itself, like we have in Italy and uh, Germany. But now, because of the nature of our environment, you don't need that. I think that's what happened now, and this is one of the Al-Qaeda scorecards, like their success in this. Come here. They spread, uh, just a second, please. They spread the idea, and that's why it's, it will leave us a lot, and we need to struggle with it many, many years to come as Muslims. What I need to say, justice. I think this is the key issue, justice. A lot of people, they were never, ever going to accept the humiliation, even if they are not part of Al-Qaeda or just, uh, like, wh whatever. Just, and justice, I think, the main source of any problems. I agree with no man. I think now uh, Al-Qaeda's threat it comes mainly from people who are influenced with an ideology. They do not need to be linked to Al-Qaeda itself to uh, or pledge allegiance to Osama bin Laden in order to uh, uh, go and do a, a terrorist attack. However, there is something we didn't touch. I think it's, it's really worrying. It's the uh, alliance that has been established in Pakistan between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, Pakistani Taliban, uh, Taliban branch in, pa in Pakistan. It's really worrying because it is not only now confined to the tribal belt on the Afghan-Pakistan border, it is spreading all over Pakistan. It is a, a very worrying thing uh, in the future. But there is also something else we haven't touched uh, or mentioned in, in this discussion. Uh, there has been a debate within Al-Qaeda itself there has been a debate within the jihadists themselves. Mm -hmm. The uh, Libyan Islamic Fighting Group issued uh, some murajaat, some revisions uh, about uh, a year and a half ago that challenged the core uh, ideology of Al-Qaeda in using violence against Islamic uh, uh, governments in the Middle East. And they even challenged many ideas that Al-Qaeda is, is, is carrying. Now this debate is all is, is, uh, uh, has, been, has started within Al-Qaeda itself. We, uh, in the last month, there has been three uh, statements issued from very high-ranking people within Al-Qaeda who have been held in Iran since 2001. And nowadays, they have started uh, saying something 
against the policies of Al Qaeda itself by Osama bin Laden and Osama and Dr. Ayman al Zawahiri. I think you know it's very interesting to see what this debate will lead uh, to in, in the future. And we haven't heard much about that anywhere else either. Well, look, I don't know. How, thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry if you were stepped on during tonight, but you've been listening to uh, all of us, and it's been fascinating listening. Don't forget, Camille has got a book. Uh, I'm happy to mention now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you for your comments as well. And uh, Dr. Uh, Maha Azam is Associate Fellow at Chatham House. Deepak Tripathi is a historian and journalist. And Noman Banotman uh, was a Mujahideen who wrote to Osama telling him to get lost. So uh, <laughs> to all of you in the room, that, that, yeah, well, he did get lost. Well, that was what, no, he's driving a cab in Peckham. But thank you all very much. Thank you very much.